Chelsea are one of the biggest football teams in the world. No, really, they're one of the biggest football teams in the world because they have so many players. Look at all of the players that Chelsea have. Now, this is a problem, not least because as Graham Potter said, it's very hard to coach a club when they have so many elite players available to them. But actually, there are rules of how many players you can have in a squad. So first of all, the most important thing is that teams can only register 25 players. You cannot register more than that. But it is important to remember that under 21 players do not count in terms of registration. Now, there are also rules about homegrown players. Each squad has to have a minimum of eight homegrown players. And if you're wondering about what a homegrown player is, that's any player who has trained for three seasons at an FA affiliated club before their 21st birthday. So let's apply these rules to the current Chelsea squad and see what we can do. So on the board here, I've got 45 players who are available to Chelsea next season in that senior squad. What we've done is we've made a potential 31 player squad that Chelsea could use next season. We've used a nice color coding here to explain our working. So what we have here is 15 senior squad members in blue or yellow, including the keepers here. And then in the red, we have 10 homegrown players, so we're well within the rules on that front. And then in the pink here, you can see dotted around the pitch, six under 21 players who do not need to be registered. So 31 players on the pitch, there's a lot of players off the pitch. These are players that we do need to move on. So on the right hand side here, we've got players who automatically just need to be sold. Now we can argue about the various iterations of these players. For example, I've included Lukaku as a striker, but it is well documented that it may be the case that he will want to move on this summer. We've also not included Joao Felix, who could be sent back to Atletico Madrid, but there is the possibility that he could become a full signing as well. But it's worth noting that Chelsea have to operate with a one-in, one-out policy at this point. So if Felix does stay, that means that Lukaku probably has to go. And this doesn't necessarily solve any problems because if you look at the two striker options here, it's unlikely that Chelsea would want to go into the season with just these two forwards. It's also worth noting that this squad looks a little bit unbalanced in certain areas. For example, in the two wide areas, we can see we've got a number of options on the left-hand side but only Noni Madueke on the right. But I think the biggest area that Chelsea will struggle with with a squad in this iteration is in this area here, the defensive midfield area, because we've put Enzo Fernandez as the primary number six. Now, Enzo Fernandez can play as a six, but he's probably a little bit wasted in those deeper areas. You probably want to have him in one of the two eight slots. And then his backup is Andre Santos, who is a youngster just brought in from South America. And actually, you probably want him to go out on loan with all of these other loan options as well. So clearly work to be done here. And the important thing to remember here here is, as we mentioned, we're operating with a one-in, one-out policy. So if you're bringing in a senior player, don't forget that Santos is an under-21, so it doesn't count towards registration. You're going to have to move another senior player out of the squad as well. So when it comes to squad building in the summer, Chelsea are going to have to be really, really careful to make sure that they are abiding by those squad building rules. But Chelsea aren't just building a squad in the abstract, they're building a squad that needs to be used by a manager. And one manager who has been strongly linked to the club in recent weeks is Maurizio Pochettino. The big question becomes, what would Maurizio Pochettino's Chelsea look like? But before we can answer that question, we need to re-familiarize ourselves with some of Pochettino's previous teams. Now, Maurizio Pochettino is a disciple of Marcelo Bielsa, and so what you should expect from a Pochettino team is a really aggressive, intense, out of possession approach. And to help that, what you'll often see with Pochettino teams structurally is a really compact forward unit because it gives you really good access to the opposition when they have the ball in the middle of the pitch. Now, with players being quite narrow, that raises questions about where you're going to find width. And for Pochettino, this width is coming from the two fullbacks. So you'll often see Carl Walker or Danny Rose during his time at Spurs getting into really advanced areas on either side of this front three. Now, by committing your fullbacks aggressively forward, what you're actually doing is introducing weaknesses into your team structure, particularly in those fullback areas that they've just vacated. Now, to counteract that, Maurizio Pochettino made a very trademark move during his time at Spurs, and that was to split his centre-backs apart leaving space for Eric Dyer then to drop in. So Eric Dyer plays almost the position of an in-between player. In certain phases of play, he'll be further up in the field and in other phases of play, particularly in possession, he's gonna drop in between the two centre-backs as well, just to make sure you have that added solidity with the two full-backs pushing forward. Now with Dyer dropping between the two centre-backs in possession, often you'll see Eriksen drifting inside to help out in the midfield area alongside Moussa Dembele. But Eriksen dropping out of the front line isn't too much of a problem because we would expect Deli Ali to push up alongside Harry Kane as an almost 
second strike. And actually what we've ended up with here is a uh, front five across the opposition back line, stretching that back line out to create space. So definite positional ideas here. But I wouldn't describe Maurizio Pochettino as an out and out positional play manager. Yes, he is using position to generate space and exploit it, particularly in this really exciting front four of Ericsson, Son, Ali and Kane, all of whom can move around, and can interchange positions. But there's also a component of directness to Maurizio Pochettino's tactics as well, which means that sometimes the Spurs players won't be as concerned about getting positional advantages. What they're gonna try and do is get the ball forward as quickly and as dangerously as possible. But there's an interesting phenomenon to notice here, because if we look at Spurs' structure in possession out of the 4-2-3-1, it actually starts looking a lot more like a 3-4-3. Obviously, you've got your two fullbacks looking more like wingbacks, two midfielders, and then a front three and a back three. Why is this important? Well, it means that Spurs can defend in two different systems while using the same ideas in possession, because this now is a back three system rather than a back four system. And this is something that we saw from Pochettino Spurs quite a lot. They could move between the 4-2-3-1 shape or the 3-4-3 shape, and the same in possession ideas are there all along. But you would see some tweaks to this system if Pochettino decided to use a back three system out of possession. What you'd usually see is one of the front line coming out and Victor Wanyama coming in alongside Musa Dembele. Now with Spurs in possession of the ball you might see Eriksen adopting these sorts of wide positions but out of possession if the opposition has a pivot player sitting in this sort of area you might not want your eight to jump forward onto him to create space in front of the defense so often what you would see is Eriksen playing as an in-between player dropping in to mark that pivot player to make sure that Spurs aren't giving up a huge amount of space in the central midfield areas and actually this starts looking a lot more like a 3-5-2 shape as well. Another area where there's a tweak is in the center back area so usually when Spurs are playing a 4-2-3-1 Eric Dyer is dropping out between the two center backs but when they start off with a back three actually Eric Dyer is being played in the outside center back position and the reason for this is that when you play with a back three you do want to find ways of getting one of your back three forward in certain situations so it could be the case that Jan Vertonghen is going to help support Danny Rose if he's playing in a particularly aggressive positioning here and then you're effectively operating with a back four system as well. So lots of flexibility here, but Jan Vertonghen on a good ball carrier, so you might want him in an outside position, and the same is true for Eric Dyer on the other. So again, more flexibility. If you want to go down the right-hand side, you can push Dyer forward. If you want to build up down the left-hand side, you can push Vertonghen forward as well. But the basic principles are all here. Spurs are operating with a number of different systems, but the principles behind them remain the same. It just gives them a huge amount of flexibility and tactical upside. So what might these tactical ideas look like imposed onto the Chelsea squad what might Maurizio Pochettino's Chelsea look like well on the board here I've just lined up Chelsea in a 4-2-3-1 shape that could work quite well with Pochettino's tactics if we look in the forward areas we don't have exactly the same profiles in every position but we do have really good players who would offer upside in Pochettino's system now Romelu Lukaku is not Harry Kane he's not going to be dropping in and helping out playing like a 10 but he is a really good front foot player he's a really direct player really good at running in behind and causing opposition's problems so that would really match up with what Pochettino is trying to do in possession and then elsewhere we've got Mikhailo Mudrik who could play the Kyungmin Son role really well, pick the ball up in wide areas, take aggressive lines towards the goal and cause all kinds of problems in those sorts of areas. We have Joao Felix who could play as a second striker in the same mould as Deli Ali. Now you may be surprised to see me including Mason Mount in this outside right position but I believe he could play that in-between role that Christian Eriksen played really well. He can operate in these wide areas but he can also move inside, help out with the midfield and do a lot of the defensive work around the opposition pivot player as well. And of course fullbacks are really important for Mauricio Pochettino and Chelsea are really lucky in that they've got Ben Chilwell and Reese James, two of the best young fullbacks in the world. And then in the centre-back area we have two really good young up-and-coming centre-backs, so lots of potential there, and then two very good options as goalkeeper. And then in the central midfield area, Mateo Kovacic actually profiles really nicely against someone like Musa Dembele. But the big problem that we see in this system is this position here. Enzo Fernandez playing that in-between role that Eric Dyer was playing. Because as we've said, Enzo Fernandez is probably already wasted as a six, but actually playing him in a role where he's required to get even deeper means that you're moving him further and further away from the areas where he can be useful. Now part of the problem here is that when we're thinking about this in-between player, we're thinking about a central midfielder who has defensive capabilities, when really we should be thinking about a centre-back who has the ability to play in that central midfield space, pass the ball around, resist pressure, a player like John Stones for example. And the problem is, is that Chelsea simply don't have a player of that profile. But as we said before, Chelsea are in a really precarious position when it comes to their squad build. They're operating with a one-in, one-out policy and the need 
need for a player of this role is just causing more problems for them there. And on top of this, there are questions to be raised that if a tactical system has a role that is so fundamental to it, and a club has no players who can play that role, then should a club be using that system in the first place? But there is another problem here, and that is the problem of fullback weaknesses. Now, we've already said that Maurizio Pochettino likes to get his fullbacks pushing forward really aggressively, and this does leave these weaknesses in the fullback area from a defensive point of view. Now, the centre midfielder dropping into the centre back line is designed to mitigate this in some sense so that your outside centre backs can now step into those areas. But there are still questions about the functionality of this kind of approach in the Premier League. One of the biggest stories this season in the Premier League has been Liverpool's decline, and Liverpool are another team who like to push their fullbacks forward, who leave these weaknesses in defensive transition in the fullback areas. And Jurgen Klopp himself has actually tried to solve these problems by using a situational back three, but it simply hasn't worked, and Liverpool still have defensive frailties in these sorts of areas, which does raise a question about Pochettino's system and whether or not it still has functionality at the highest level of the Premier League. Now, Mauricio Pochettino might point to Liverpool and say the bigger problem here is that their midfield press has dropped in intensity and then they're not giving as much support to that back line as is necessary. And he might also argue that he would get the press at Chelsea working much more efficiently so those problems didn't arise. But perhaps there's another solution here, and it's a solution that Maurizio Pochettino has used before, and that is rather than using a situational back three where you're dropping players in to help out, why not just use a straight up back three from the start? Now there's a really obvious upside to this structure because we can take Enzo Fernandez out of that back line and put him into his more favoured number eight spot in the midfield. But the problem is, is that we're going to have to take a player out of the forward line in order to add a player to the back line. So we're probably going to end up taking the number 10 out and bringing in someone like Thiago Silva. And moving Joao Felix out of the starting 11 actually works because we have Mason Mount playing this in-between role that we saw Christian Eriksen playing for Pochettino at Spurs. Because as we've said, Mount can work in these wider areas but you can also drift inside and help out out of possession and close down the opposition pivot player when needed as well. But there is another problem here and that is that we have taken a player out of the forward line to put them in the back line and that means there's one less slot to fit all of your players in and if we look on the right hand side of the board here there's a lot of players who would expect to be in a starting 11. We've got Nkunku, Havertz, Sterling, Madueke, Gallagher and Joao Felix down here at the bottom. So by playing a system which suits this squad better, we've actually reduced the amount of playing time there would be for all of these really elite players. And actually, if we look at the board itself, we've ended up with Chelsea playing a 3-4-3. So we've gone through this whole thought experiment of what Maurizio Pochettino's Chelsea might look like, and we've ended up at the same conclusion that the last two Chelsea coaches have arrived at, and that is that this squad best suits a 3-4-3, and that you're going to have a lot of elite players who simply do not fit into that system. And this suggests that the problems at Chelsea aren't going to be fixed through managerial appointments alone, but we're only going to start seeing solutions when the decision makers at the club start getting a handle on the shape of the squad itself. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.